Today we come to the fourth beatitude. Jesus surprises us with a fresh paradox. I kind of wrote that out and then I thought, well, maybe it would be more surprising if he didn't because we're getting a lot of them. He's taught us already that you can be happy even though you're poor to the point of destitution. That's the first beatitude. And then he held out happiness for people who are in the pits of sadness and mourning. That's a paradox. Then last week we learned that Jesus spoke of meek people who don't get their way as people that can be happy. And today it's the beatitude that offers happiness to people who are hungering and thirsting. And especially uh, on Thanksgiving week, we would not usually associate hunger and thirst with a happy condition. Well, we would want to be full. Well, it's not entirely a bad thing to have a good appetite, right? That's a form of hunger. We'll call that a mild case. You sort of want a desire for food and drink to kick in shortly before the next incredible meal arrives. But see, you had a delicious meal a few hours before. Um, so Jesus is not talking about a mild case of hunger, uh, such as you get when dinner's not quite on time. This is serious hunger. So if you're filling out notes and you have uh, till the PowerPoint kind of cuts in, uh, we're talking about something that is uh, a serious hunger that's not just like late dinner. This is more like the kind that is experienced around the world where there's starvation. There are three million children under five that die of starvation every year. Uh, we don't see that often in our area. As I speak, my father is in Pennsylvania watching his dear wife of 26 years die of starvation. Um, Joe is in the last days of cancer. She won't make it to Thanksgiving. Well, Jesus' listeners know about that kind of hunger. Uh, this beatitude could have been translated, happy are those famished and parched. And that, of course, would have made the paradox more obvious and somewhat alarming. Well, when Jesus uses the words like hunger and thirst, he's talking about what people want. In fact, what they want most. Also about what they need most. It makes you ask the question to yourself, uh, what do I really crave the most? I mean, to be honest, would it be uh, some, something that's very pleasurable? It could be success of some kind. It could be a jumbo bag of Cheetos. Um, we would for sure connect getting what we crave with the pursuit of happiness. I, let's say my great craving is to go to El Gaucho's and get a four-course meal. I would expect a visit there to produce a fair amount of happiness. Uh, I wouldn't spend all that money to just increase my misery. Um, but if we have an extremely hard time explaining how we'd get happy if we didn't get what we craved, just think how especially miserable we would be if we found out that we had no hope of ever getting what we want most. Now here's my question. Is it possible that there's something in this world that you could crave where the mere craving for it is a source of great happiness? That's what we're going to find out from Jesus today. Now, the first thing that's obvious is that you're not famished for something that you already have. This beatitude, like the first three, starts with the admission of need, even painful failure. Uh, Jesus starts with poverty. I would be putting up the Beatitudes up here, but if you can review them in your mind, happy are the destitute in spirit. Um, he asks us to see ourselves through God's eyes as needy, broke, helplessly in debt to the God that we have robbed of glory. Is there something up there? You want to flip that around, then I'll kind of... Huh? Oh, that's not working, but that is. Okay. My rear view mirror. I'm not seeing much. Um... The confession of destitution leads to grieving and mourning, and Jesus says we can be happy when we grieve because our shame and our weeping over our sins leads to a kind of comfort that can make us eternally happy. And then the broken hearts open us to a desperate hope that we could actually have a life of wholeness, but it will have to be lived in great humility, a complete meekness. That's Beatitude 3. Our wills have to be tamed to the purposes and pleasures of God. Not my will, but yours be done. We can't live for ourselves anymore. But now today, we get to Beatitude 4. Maybe this is the pinnacle of the four. We have this amazing statement, happy are those hungering and thirsting for righteousness because they will be satisfied. Our hearts somehow get free. has to be by the Spirit of God. 
to desire righteousness like a starving man desires food, like a parched man thirsts for even a sip of water. Meekness has taught us to stop craving the things that this world offers us, to give up ambition and to be content with whatever God supplies for us. But now Jesus teaches us to have a holy discontent. This is the hunger, the thirst, so that we hunger and thirst for the things of God's kingdom, a better world. I'm just kind of giving a summary of where we're going here. This might be the biggest difference, in fact, between Christians and non-Christians. It's not that Christians live so much better than others. It's that God has revealed to true Christians that they lack the thing that they actually need most. And then he tells them what it is. It is this honest sense of emptiness and failure that opens the door to happiness. Now, the world has longings. The world burns for something, but they don't know what it is. And so for them, it takes many different forms, Uh, but God tells us what it is and where to get it, and it's the thing you have to have or you will never enter God's kingdom, and so you crave it. Now, I can't go any farther explaining this beatitude if I don't try to identify what Jesus means by righteousness. We're still in the introduction part. What is this righteousness that you're supposed to be panting over? Well, this is a major theme of this whole Sermon on the Mount. Uh, There's a key statement in it that that says your righteousness has to surpass that of the scribes and Pharisees or you can't enter God's kingdom. And then later in the sermon, when he's talking about not worrying about the things of this life, such as food and clothing, he says that we must seek first the kingdom of God and his, here's the key word, righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So righteousness is a theme here. We want to know what it means. Well, there are four aspects of righteousness that Jesus could be referring to. The first would be as an attribute of God. God himself is righteous, which means that he always acts in accord with what is right because it is his very character. In fact, it is his character that establishes what is right and against which we know what is wrong. Now, this is part of God's holiness, we can take even a bigger topic. This is his absolute purity now expressed in how he does everything he does. A related word is justice, that God will always do the right thing is when, remember Abraham, when he was overseeing the impending judgment of Sodom, he proclaimed in the form of a question, shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly or do right? So now this is the God part of it. Now, the second aspect of righteousness is that it is a right standing with God that we can have, which is commonly called justification. This righteousness is received. I'm going to teach you a little theology here real quick. This righteousness is received when when you're saved. By faith, a condemned sinner is pardoned of all his sin and is treated now as if he had all the righteousness of the obedient Son of God. All his sinful sins, his awful sins, are laid on Jesus when Jesus dies on the cross. They are completely paid for by Christ's blood. That's one side. And on the other side, the positive side, all the wonderful, amazing righteousness of Christ is now laid upon the sinner or imputed to him so that he now has a perfect standing with the glorious God as perfect as the standing of the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God. This is imputed righteousness. Now, the third aspect of it. I think it's a C in your notes. After and only after you have been declared righteous by faith, you will have a shot at what we call personal righteousness or what we call growth in holiness, obedience. This is sometimes called progressive sanctification and it goes eventually to glorification when it's complete. This is what you look back at as you crawl into bed at night. You ever been in bed at night and you're thinking back over the day and you think, wow, what sins did I give into today? I, I need to confess them. Was I more like Jesus than I was yesterday? How is the righteous character of God actually displayed in me? This righteousness is how you actually live. It's not your standing. It's, let's just call it your walking. It's the, and the blessed culmination of it will be the day that this life is over and God makes you completely righteous for eternity. Your sinning days will be over. Praise God. And then there's one more kind of righteousness that's bigger than your little life. There is the whole world around you. We know that the, the whole 
earth, especially when we get to the new earth, there will be a, where righteousness will someday dwell in every corner. We learned that in 2 Peter 3, 13. Some call this, you could call it social righteousness or, or justice, social rightness. That's when everything is perfectly conformed to what is right, to everything that God wants. Now, I hardly have to tell you, it's not what we see around us today, where sin and corruption run almost unchecked. Now, you keep those four aspects of righteousness in mind, because we're going to come back to those. Now, as we take this beatitude apart, we will first of all try to convince ourselves that hunger and thirst are good things. So, major point number one, if you're trying to find something in the notes, happy are, it says, and so now I'm going to talk about estimating the value of appetite by listing the effects of not having one. Is that going up, up, up there at all? Wow, okay. Someone's reading my mind up there. Thank you, people. Now, Jesus says the pathway to happiness is hunger. And that's kind of odd coming from God who never needs to eat. Was Jesus ever even hungry? Well, duh, of course he was. <laughs> he did fast for 40 days. I think maybe that taught him a few things about a gnawing, a gnawing stomach and how it could be a righteous thing. Yeah, but was he ever thirsty? Well, he sure will be when he's on the cross. We have that little statement from the cross, I thirst. Well, what would happen if you never got hungry or thirsty? It just didn't happen to you. And now, now I'm talking about literal hunger and thirst to see what we can learn from those. But um, first of all, it would save a lot of time and money uh, if you could just dispense with food and drink. But if you have zero sense of the need for food and drink, we all know you're still in a deep way, whether you feel it or not, in need. You're still hungry. You just don't know it. So the first thing is if you had no appetite, you could just forget to eat, and then you would grow weak and eventually die. So we're going to call this weakness. If you don't force yourself to eat and drink. I mean, I, I've heard of extreme situations where people have lost their appetite and they start wasting away. I think Earl told me about a relative that had this happen. I don't know where he's sitting, but uh, I mean, I have this problem every morning, uh, even though I hide it well. The wasting away part, not so much. But my stomach doesn't wake up until noon, so I have to force myself to eat some breakfast because I know it's, it's better for me. So long live honey bunches of oats. But let's say the first effect of not having an appetite is weakness. But then let's say you force yourself to eat without any appetite, but it doesn't taste very good. If you don't have an appetite, then it, I mean, it all kind of tastes the same. So you plow through a plate of uh, Kathy Absher's incredible lasagna, but you barely notice. The enjoyment is gone. So that's the second effect of a lost appetite, and we're going to call it boredom. The dish can be professionally prepared by, I mean, get Bobby, Bobby Flay to make you something amazing with exotic spices and sauces, but it's all wasted on you. You could just as well be eating a hot dog from 7-Eleven. And then one more effect, your lack of appetite might be an indication that something more serious is wrong with you. I'm calling this one danger. A loss of appetite is often a symptom that something deeper isn't right. Well, this is not a medical lecture, so uh, we're talking about having or not having a spiritual appetite. And we may be experiencing, and you right here sitting in this place, experiencing a lack of desire for God, for spiritual growth, for the Word of God. Maybe your level of craving is kind of low. How many of you know that your spiritual desire is weaker than it should be or than it used to be? Don't raise your hand, but... Just think about yourself. There are lots of things that can dampen our spiritual appetite. In fact, we're in a battle all the time to keep our hunger for God and His righteousness foremost in our heart. Now, it's, when I say that, I don't mean to imply that the hunger itself is what we crave. There are some Christians who spend all their time trying to crank up their feelings about God as if that were the real goal. No, the focus is supposed to be on the object of our craving, which in this case is righteousness. So you don't even have to like your craving, which is actually, a, it is a kind of pain, but you have to get very concerned when you're not feeling it anymore. Billy Graham just celebrated his 98th birthday last Monday. Thirty years ago, he addressed the Urbana Missions Conference where thousands of college students come to hang on every word of the speakers, but to have Billy Graham there is probably pretty special. Uh, you might have been there. Um, he challenged his audience. He said, what will you be like as a Christian 10 years from now? 
Many will be walking with Christ, serving Him in various capacities around the world. But for others, there will be a tragedy because 10 years from now, they will have lost their burning zeal and love for Christ. Not necessarily because they wanted to or because they set their heart in rebellion against God's will, but because they set their life by the world's agenda. And then Christ and His Great Commission gradually dims. Maybe that's happened to you. Your appetite has been suppressed, partly because maybe you just constantly absorbed absorbed a diet that makes your truest hunger kind of go away. Your regular diet is, you know, the same stuff everyone does, the same amusements that entertain them, the people that have never met the glorious God. And so you keep going down to the cisterns that Jeremiah talks about, that you keep digging, but they can't hold any water. When you could have... God Himself, the fountain of living waters, Jeremiah 2.13. Do you wonder why you are weak and maybe bored with spiritual stuff? If so, you're in danger, very serious danger. Now let's look at what can be done about it. This is our major point number two. We're going to talk about those hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Cultivate a passion for all that's right. Now some of us might have to admit Lots of days my heart is more likely hungering and thirsting for unrighteousness. But I want us to explore what Jesus really meant by that kind of craving. And first of all, this is a real hunger, not a tidy little doctrine that states in precise biblical language just how needy we are, and we write it in our notebook. This hunger is as real as if you were drifting along in a raft, lost at sea, and have not been able to even moisten your lips except with the briny water that makes your thirst worse. This God-given sense of lack is a real craving for righteousness. You feel it. You have to have your sins pardoned. You must be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. You must get some answers about the sins that dog you and about the awful sins that plague your world. This is not the polite guy that is offered some food and he would like a meal, but he can very well do without it. Thank you all in good time. No, this is desperate hunger. This is not all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This is, I have sinned, and every day I am coming short of the glory of God. And you feel it will break your heart if that keeps happening. And it feels like it could kill you. Oh, that I could be done with this. What a wretched man I am, as Paul said at the end of Romans chapter 7. How much I long for heaven when I'll never sin and grieve my master again. That's what we mean by hunger. And this is stronger than any desire for wealth because when you feel this hunger, you would rather be poor and righteous than rich and stay evil. You would rather be sick and have righteousness than enjoy great health and continue to wallow in your sins. You would rather have trials of all sorts than be problem-free if it means those trials help you grow in righteousness, like James talked about, this pathway to sheer joy. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Endurance, character, growth, righteousness, we could call it. This hunger is real, and it's not just in your notebook. It's in your guts, and this is the hunger and the thirst that Jesus blesses with joy. Hunger is a sign of lack, but it's also a sign of life. This is why it's a craving that, though painful and humbling, can also give us joy. I ask the question, is it possible there's something in this world that you could crave where the mere craving for it is a source of great happiness? And that thing would be righteousness. Now, if you are physically dead and you're lying in the morgue, if that's happened to you, raise your hand. All right, you're dead. You don't have any cravings. If you're alive, people don't have to tell you to get hungry and thirsty. It's the first thing a new, a lot of you have welcomed a newborn into the world. You know, after they take their first breath and then they have a good cry, they want what? Where's my mama? So when you wonder sometimes if you're alive in Christ, and I know this happens to us at various times, you keep having struggles with the same habits and you sometimes slump over and you weep because it looks like you'll never change. Take joy at least in this. If you weren't alive, you wouldn't care. If you weren't alive, you just wouldn't care. The cry of the new nature that we have from Christ is for holiness and for a greater conformity to Christ. If you weren't a new person, you wouldn't struggle. You wouldn't weep. 
you wouldn't get frustrated. Have you ever heard a shout from the graveyard, is it dinner time yet? But when you're alive, you can't help yourself. You must have righteousness. Now, this hunger and thirst is not for self-improvement. It is self-improvement, but it's not for self-improvement. I have to warn you that there's a counterfeit struggle where you, you labor to improve yourself, but for the wrong reasons, even if you're still dead in your sins. Even corpses would, would like to have their best suit on and their hair arranged and, and a little makeup to make them look like they're still alive. But here's where the hypocrisy can come in. Jesus will challenge this when he gets to the next chapter of the sermon, chapter 6, verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Now the Pharisee, with all his attention to behavior, doesn't actually hunger and thirst for righteousness. He is quite sure that he has all the righteousness he needs. What he craves is reputation. This is why we have to go back for a minute to the four aspects of righteousness. So if we can bring that little panel back up, that would be great. So the first kind of righteousness, God's attribute. Your hunger and your thirst is to know God in His perfect righteousness because this is part of your great admiration and worship of a God like no other. It's like Paul yearning that, the yearning that made him cast away everything else as dung, that I may know Him. Referring to Jesus as His King. You long to know Him for His own glory, not to improve yourself. He's worthy to be known, to be honored for his perfections, even if he never does one cotton pick a nice thing for you. It's a joke to claim that you crave righteousness if you have no love for God himself. How ridiculous to long for the kingdom without the king, without loving the king, because <laughs> hungering and thirsting are love words. This is you beyond yourself, focusing on something not you, you know, you take the king out of kingdom and all you have left is dumb. <laughs> the psalmist says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy is the man who takes refuge in him. Psalm 34, 8. Your heart is hungry. Not just to know that God is righteous or to admire him for it, but to actually savor God because he is good when you taste him. That means, when it's translated to the Greek word at least, means something like delicious and sweet and pleasant and kind and pure and untainted, unmixed with anything that could ever harm you. Peter tells us to crave the word if we want to savor God like that. 1 Peter 2, 2 and 3. Now then you hunger, here's B, you hunger and thirst to know the reality of sins forgiven and the reality of having a perfect standing based on nothing that you ever did or can do. Obviously, you would always run from a righteous God unless something had been done to stem his wrath. So give up this idea like, oh, there's God, completely righteous, isn't this wonderful? That's nothing wonderful without the cross. So your hunger makes you love the cross. You are thirsty for grace. You crave being set free from all self-religion where you're never sure if you've done enough to merit God's embrace. You crave the freedom of entering into God's presence based solely on Christ's blood and His resurrection without the slightest fear God will ever cast you out. You quote that double beatitude of the psalmist David, like Paul did in Romans 4. This is from Psalm 32. Happy is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. And then once you know you're forgiven and accepted in Christ, you examine your life and you begin hungering for personal righteousness. You realize how far from God and His ways you have lived. And maybe now are even living. The grimy gush of sin that used to dominate you seems to flow stronger than ever. And you have no confidence that you even can improve yourself. Sins that you used to do without thinking now bother you a great deal. And you begin to cry out that you are a wretch in your sins. And you want to be like Jesus. But there are days you seem to be more like the devil. You need personal holiness. And you start praying, Lord, make me like you. Subdue my pride. Teach me to hate it. Purify my motives because even the good stuff that I do seems to be really to just make me well thought of or to make you do something for me. And then there's that lie I told or the look that I looked or the cutting word I said, the candy I sneaked. This is ugly. 
I'm so empty without you. I want to be pure like you. This is hunger. You begin to worry that those sins could condemn you if God doesn't keep hold of you. So you memorize Romans 8 and quote it every day. Your faith is stretched. You are getting the picture. This is hungering and thirsting for righteousness. It improves you, but it's not for self-improvement. Remember I said it's a love word. And it's a love not for yourself, but for righteousness. It's a love for even the righteousness that it would extend around you, beyond yourself. You look around, you realize you're part of a great company on earth. Now this here is D. There's a great company on earth that needs God just as much as you do. So you start aching over the sins of the world around you, in your neighborhood, in your, at your workplace, in your gym. Not just your own sins. You have this constant discontent with everything unlike God. That's what Broadus called it. This is not limited to issues like peace and hunger and discrimination and the persecution of our dear brothers and sisters across the world. This is where your heart is broken, that God is so dishonored in this world. That's the grief part. Now, the hunger part is this. You long with everything in you for the day when there's no more fraud in government or business. There's no more oppression of vulnerable weak people, and no more deceit in the media, and no more abuse by lustful perverts, and no more theft, no more injustice. All the slums gone, and the orphans loved, and the fallen women restored to purity. And that lonely young girl I just read about with the word empty carved with a razor into her forearm, may she be finally and everlastingly filled and gloriously satisfied with grace. May all the restless youth find their rest in Christ. This is hungering for righteousness beyond yourself. It means you crave for the day when every knee will bow to the glory and majesty of the real king. And that's when they will never again hunger and never again thirst. I'm reading from Revelation 7 where it talks about Jesus, our shepherd, the lamb, leading them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And I love that verse almost more than any in the Bible because it says God himself is going to wipe your tears away. You burn for the day when the bride of the Lamb is complete and the bell for the great marriage supper will finally be rung. You long for ways to hasten that day. (laughs) You hunger for others that they too may have righteousness. I mean, that's why I'm a pastor. And your craving leads you to make serious investments in the righteousness of your own family and your church and your community. But first, you've got to hunger and thirst for it. This is not hunger for one political party over another. It's not lust for influence or power, but simply that you may do something, anything, to move things along toward what is right, for the glory of God, not the glory of you. Therefore, this is not passivity. It's not like you sit back and wonder if you'll ever become righteous, and then you wait for God to do something while you twiddle your spiritual thumbs and you watch Columbo reruns. The word righteousness is actually in a different case than you normally have following the verbs hungering and thirsting. And I I, I won't get into the grammar because it won't necessarily mean a lot to most of you, but this is why the King James translation had something kind of neat, and I wish I had put this in this translation. It says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, after, like coming after something. This is an active pursuit of righteousness. Now, so you can ask, when is God going to do something about it? Maybe as soon as He wakens your hunger for it. It's not like you look into your soul and you see this little righteousness void, and somehow you can't take steps of repentance and obedience. It's not like you look around the community and you see rampant evil and suffering, and the only thing you can do is shrug your shoulders and watch the world swirl into hell. No, a person who is validly famished or parched is driven to do almost anything. If not, it's not the kind of hunger Jesus is talking about. If you are desperate for a taste of righteousness, you will drive tiring miles to hear the Word taught. You will empty your pocketbook to help the gospel go to places like Liberia and Turkey and other things that God places on your heart. It leads you to pray all night for your wayward son or daughter. This is holy craving, and it's a direct path to outlandish joy. But this hunger is, even though it's painful at times, it's worth it because it's 
Well, even if it's not for yourself, because this painful passion could even turn people into martyrs, and nothing is more joyful than that. Now, here's a final caution. This is not perfectionism. I know you're going to thirst for righteousness so I can be perfect. Well, now it's right to have a hunger to be as perfect as Jesus. I mean, no lesser goal is worthy of a redeemed soul. But perfectionism is something very different and disturbing. I was reading the best bowling story ever, although it is the only one I've ever read, but anyway. (laughs) It was about a guy named Bill Fong. This guy is a 48-year-old Texas barber who had a night he will never forget. Now, you know what a perfect game is? 300. 300 pins, 12 strikes in a row. Well, that's pretty tough to get, but that's not perfection by bowling standards. 300 games are just too common. Bill had rolled many of those before the night when everything was so magical that the first 300 was followed by a second, and then came the third game. Would he get the elusive 900 series that has been done only 21 times in spite of 95 million bowlers over how many years? January 18, 2010, remember that date. Everyone in the alley is crowded around with their breath held and their fingers crossed. No one can make eye contact. It's the tenth frame. It starts with the first wobbly strike of the night. The next is like Moses parting the Red Sea, only one to go. The ball starts out so perfect, people begin to clap before it even reaches the pins. But this perfect ball, the last of 36 amazing strikes, is not a strike. The ten pin wobbles, but refuses to fall. Strangers fall to their knees. Fong can't even think. Two years later, Fong and his friends sit around and they talk about what they always talk about, the great 899 series, a Texas state record. And Fong talks about it. He says he truly believes that that last pin could have made his life perfect. It would have made all the difference. If he could just have been the best there is at something, he wouldn't just be a regular guy anymore. So he goes over and over in his mind, that last roll, should he have practiced more? Was he using the wrong ball? Later that night, that very night that he had near perfection, he suffered a stroke. Uh, No lie. And his friends are just glad to have him alive, but he rehabs and he keeps bowling. And he's bowled 10 more 300s, but never a 900. And he is haunted, one pin short of significance. He's still trying for perfection. It's hard to be just a regular guy. Now this is so important, hungering for righteousness is not a quest to make you feel special, to create an extraordinary you. It is, at its core and at its best, a quest to show how special Jesus is. If you can get that straight, your hunger for righteousness can be righteous. Your quest is not an attempt to find you. It's a quest to find Him and find Him as the bread of life. And you thirst for Him, but He's the water of life. You stew over your own well-being and your own righteousness, And Jesus says, stop it. Seek first the kingdom of God and whose righteousness? His righteousness. And then God takes care of everything else. All these things you worry about, including your own significance, will be added to you in God's good time. So Jesus ends his fourth beatitude with another promise. To the poor, he offers a kingdom. To the mourners, comfort. To the meek, the earth. Now he offers satisfaction. This is where most of the joy comes from. Now, if you have this kind of craving for righteousness, and you can't say this about any other craving because every other craving can be eternally frustrated. But if you have this kind of craving for righteousness, then you can have joy because this craving will always lead to satisfaction, what even the Rolling Stones could never get. Because they will be satisfied. Rest joyfully. This is point three, in the prospect of complete righteousness. The word satisfied is another divine passive. Uh, God is the most important person in this verse. He is so big that he doesn't even need to be named. Who is going to make you satisfied? God will. You can rephrase the beatitude like this. If people hunger and thirst after righteousness, they are happy because God is going to satisfy them. Now, satisfied, that is a farm term. 
for what a shepherd does for his sheep. And you can't help but read as backstory the 23rd Psalm. You know it? I mean, I hope you do. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Then where does it go? He makes me lie down in green pastures. That's the eating part. He leads me beside still waters. That's the drinking part. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of, here's our key word, righteousness. Now, did you hear that? Righteousness. Now, who, who leads you into paths of righteousness? Not you. He leads you. He provides for you. He's going to satisfy you with righteousness. So he puts you in those paths where you find righteousness, and then it adds this, for your name's sake. No, for his name's sake. And this is where the piddly perfectionism dies. This is for Jesus' reputation, the shepherd who fills you. So it is God who fills you. And that is why you can always say, I shall not want. Do you think there's some hunger that you have where the mighty maker of the universe and the shepherd of your soul is going to run out of resources? Like running out of pumpkin waffles at the men's breakfast. Or do you think your good shepherd will, and you know, he's going to get grumpy someday and be unwilling to feed you. He'll refuse to serve you at some point. Never. And how do I know that? And I think this is so beautiful. Because Jesus promised right here on the Mount of Beatitudes that those who are famished for righteousness will be satisfied. He said it. Now you think about the word satisfied. It's a word that means to be fed to the full. Where you can't eat another bite, you can't take another swallow. You're stuffed. And the need you are feeling has been satisfied. Now, what are you stuffed with? Well, it must be the thing you were craving, right? Which is righteousness. Now, you wouldn't bring a starving man petunias or play a spiffy polka on the accordion or tell him an amusing vacation story or even show him reruns of the great Julia Child cooking. Nothing will content him but one thing, food. Nothing will content the famished and parched sinner but righteousness. Give me God's kingdom and His righteousness or I die. How I long for a clean conscience and a clean start and a clean world. How I long for sins to be done. Not because they bother me, because they don't that much. That's part of my problem. But because they bother God. Now look, no other craving really gets filled. At least not for long. You look at a teen with a hollow leg, he wants some pepperoni pizza and he scarfs down 18 pieces until he's holding his stomach. And a short time later, he's at the drive through to Taco Bell ordering a couple of grilled stuffed burritos and a jumbo Sprite. But if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will be filled so that you're satisfied. You will never hunger or thirst the way you did before. Now, there's something I need to say about that, that actually there's a satisfying kind of filling there, and this sounds contradictory, but your hunger actually doesn't go away. You don't want this appetite to go away. The more righteousness you taste, the more you would gladly, even painfully desire it all the more. And you don't hate, don't, well, don't you hate it at Thanksgiving when you discover that eating ruins your appetite? Because you are so stuffed and then they bring out all the desserts. Or you've just barely tasted little portions of all the amazing dishes spread across the serving table when you realize you're not hungry anymore and you can't eat all the stuff you want to. And then there's still pumpkin pie. You know, that's what happens to natural hunger. Well, that's the, what I put on my name tag. I haven't put it on yet, but pumpkin pie. But supernatural hunger is not like that. It is placed in you by the Holy Spirit, and it increases with eating. Grace fills us as from a fountain, not a little teacup, and then enlarges our capacity for grace, which is available in infinite, inexhaustible supply. And then the fuller you are, the more you crave the sweet treats of divine righteousness. Not like that special pie that you OD on just one too many times to the point where you hope you never, ever see another slice of it again. No, you will say enough because it is enough. But then you will never be sick of it. What a blessing to finally be full of something besides yourself. Now, you can't say the same thing if your big obsession is money. The richest of misers is never quite as rich as he'd want. He's not satisfied. Or think of power. I was reading about Alexander the Great. He conquered the world, I mean, shortly after 30 years old. And he's looking for more real estate when he dies the same year. Dies of agony. 
or in agony, probably the sad upshot of years of heavy drinking. Well, our souls are too big for such small meals. As I quoted from Thomas Watson a few weeks ago, nothing of this world is big enough or glorious enough to fill the desires of our God-given souls because they were meant to be filled with God, our righteous God. And of course, this is ultimately then a hunger for God himself. And once you have Christ, you have all you'll ever need. It's all Jesus. Well, that brings up the question, when does this satisfaction come? And I think it depends on what aspect of righteousness you're thinking of. So bring up that panel one more time. If it's A, that is the righteousness of God as an attribute, then in all eternity we will be discovering the great character of our Maker. And He will satisfy you over and over and over again every day that you look at Him, every time you consider Him. And if it's B, which is justification, then you eat and drink of Christ from the moment you come to faith because Christ Himself is given to you. It's symbolized by what we do at the Lord's table, even today. And then if it's C or D, we get satisfying foretastes of righteousness right now. We look around us, and while we look in our own soul, we see sometimes we actually grow. Sometimes we actually obey when we wouldn't have. And we're satisfied with that. And the day is yet to come when all evil, though, is fully put away from our own heart, from the whole earth. And on that day, then we will be completely satisfied and forever. There will be righteousness all over the world. And in fact, back in that beatitude passage of Isaiah, kind of the, the breeding ground for all these beatitudes, uh, Isaiah says that God's rescued people will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that He may be glorified. That's what we're looking for. Our craving for that is one of the reasons that we long for the second coming of our Lord. The battle may go against us now, but eventually righteousness will flood the earth and dwell there. Now, one thing for sure, if you try to live and keep on sinning and you hope to find some comfort in that, you will be disappointed. You will never be happy or satisfied. Well, that leads me to ask a final question. What's the level of your craving? We have seen the awesome level of God's provision, infinite. Well, what's the level of my hunger and thirst? We could also ask about the level of our righteousness, but this beatitude presumes a lack of righteousness. The issue is how much we actually crave what we lack. The deal is when we don't crave God's righteousness, we don't crave God himself. Unfortunately, we might have a life with God that's like the saddest story in the Bible. Is it possible your relationship with God It's sort of like Jacob's relationship with Leah. Two sisters, the younger, lovely in form and beautiful, the older sister with weak eyes, maybe crossed eyes or almost blind. Both are destined for the same husband. Jacob is wild about the younger sister, Rachel, from the start. Gives seven years of hard work to make her his wife. But they seem like only a few days. He gladly sacrifices for her. But you know the story of how he is tricked by his father-in-law, Laban. He ends up with the older sister, Leah, the one he never wanted. Jacob is incensed that her father slipped the unwanted sister into his bed in the dark. But what could he do? What a honeymoon. Eventually, he marries Rachel, too. After another seven years, so now everything's okay. He provides shelter and food for both. He carries all Cutters out the expected duties of a husband. Children come, and they are cherished and blessed. But Jacob never loves Leah. He meets his obligations and honors his commitments, but no passion, no hunger. Marriage by the numbers. Have you ever woken up and realized God is your Leah, not your Rachel? Married on paper baptismal certificate to prove it, said your vows, perform your duties, but no fire in the belly, no trembling knees, no real hunger, no real thirst. If so, I'm sad for you, but I'm even sadder for Leah, for God. Leah, you know, was wounded and disappointed, always knew she took a back seat. She could see it in his eyes. So I want you to stop now and ask God to be your Rachel. 
to say to him, I really want to want you, Lord. I am weary of making religion without any appetite. I'm committing Christianity in cold blood, and it's a crime. I know I need to reserve the best of myself for my relationship with you. That's Rachel love. I can see that my lack of passion for you tells the world around me that you are not very lovely after all. But he is lovely. He offers himself freely as food and drink for you. And there is nothing lukewarm about his love for you. 28 years ago this week, Susanna Petroisen hears her daughter's pleas, but there's nothing she can do. She and her four-year-old Guyani are trapped beneath tons of collapsed concrete and steel. Beside them is their sister-in-law, her sister-in-law, one of 55,000 victims of the world worst earthquake ever to hit Soviet Armenia. When the quake hit, the three tumbled through the floor down five stories into the basement. Mommy, I need a drink. Please give me something. There's nothing to give her. Susanna is trapped flat on her back with a concrete slab 18 inches above. Feeling around in the darkness, she finds a big jar of blackberry jam that has mercifully fallen with them into the basement and didn't break. She gives the entire jar to her daughter to eat, not thinking that they could be trapped for days. It is gone by the second day. Mommy, I'm so thirsty. Susanna knows she will die, but she wants her daughter to live. She reaches around. She finds a dress in the darkness, makes a bed for Guyani. Though it's bitter cold, she takes off her own stockings and wraps them around her child. The two are trapped for eight days. Cold and disoriented, the mother loses track of time, loses the feeling in her fingers and her toes. She's just waiting for death. She slips in and out of sleep, often wakened by the pleading voice of her daughter. Mommy, I'm thirsty. At some point in that eternal night, Susanna has an idea. She remembers a TV program where an explorer in the Arctic is dying of thirst. His comrade slashes open his hand and gives his friend his blood. Susanna recalls, I had no water, no fruit juice, no liquids. It was then I remembered I had my own blood. Her groping fingers, numb and cold, find a piece of shattered glass. She slices open her left index finger and gives it to her daughter to suck. The drops of blood are not enough. Her daughter says, Mommy, please, some more. Susanna has no idea how many times she cut herself. She just knows that if she hadn't, Guyani would not have lived. Her blood was her daughter's only hope. Beneath the rubble of our fallen world, Jesus pierces his hands. In the wreckage of our collapse, he rips open his side. We're trapped. We're dying of thirst. So he gives us his blood. That's all he has. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. It is enough. But he has to die to make you live. He proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It is the hardest thing to imagine why everyone doesn't crave him. Father in glory, satisfy our hearts even today as we crave for all that's right, especially all that's right according to the gospel itself, that sinners would come to you and find forgiveness and find a wealth in their heart that they never even knew existed. I pray that even today there are people here that have been longing and didn't even know they were longing for righteousness, but your Holy Spirit is helping them see what they're longing for is Christ himself. And their hearts would find their rest in him. So Lord, satisfy our hearts even as we come. On this day when we are having communion, on this day when we even have a potluck dinner, may that richer feast be the fact that you have satisfied us with yourself. In Christ's name, amen.